Good morning. Welcome. My name is Sherry Magnan, and I am one of the deacons here at East Woodstock Congregational Church. We are an open and affirming congregation of the United Church of Christ. We are in a season of Easter and continue to celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Whether we worship in person or online, all of us are welcome in God's presence, and we're glad that we can be together today and worship God. Thank you to everyone who is helping make our worship special today. Our greeters, Amy Hiller White and Valerie Law, acolyte Jackie Dearborn, and we'd like to thank Nancy Ducharme and the choir for providing music today. Please look at our website to find out more about our church and how to support our church activities at eastwoodstockchurch.org. If you have any questions about our church, please look at one of the, look for one of the deacons wearing our red name tags and we will answer them for you. Today we have an announcement from Lynn Luby about the Jamboree. Good morning. Good morning. Um, I would like to take a minute, or maybe two, of your time. Um, my name is Lynn Luby. I'm a member of this year's uh, 4th of July Jamboree. And um, I would like to piggyback off of Jess's children's story last week about what it means to be part of a church community. Um, this year marks the 66th 4th of July Jamboree, and we are going to be holding it in person. Yay! Yes. Yeah. So I'd like to take you on a trip down memory lane, and we'll start back at 1957, the first Jamboree. So in 1957, they raised approximately $900, and it was to be a one-time event to have the farm community come together for fellowship and to raise money to build Fellowship Hall. Everyone enjoyed it so much that it began the tradition that we still have today. In the early years, the jamboree lasted until about 10 p.m., and the cake, yeah, hardy yeah. People. And the cake walk has been taking place for 59 years and is still probably one of our favorite events. Uh, there was a soapbox derby. Uh, Mark Billings, talk to Mark Billings and John Davis. They can give you all the escapades of the soapbox derby down Prospect Street. Um, and uh, doll carriage parade. And contests like croquet, Hole in one, horseshoes, badminton, and ring toss. In 1962, there was a coffee and donut booth where there were 30 dozen donuts sold and seven pounds of coffee. In the 1970s, there was a post rider who delivered the Declaration of Independence, and at 10 p.m., there were Liberty Torch Runners. In the 80s, the program began to look a lot like we have today but was still going on into the evening hours. In the 90s, we had shortened the day. <laughs> the, evening, the event ended at 5.30, and in 1995, I don't know if any of you will remember, there was a Revolutionary War soldiers encampment with a drill and musket firing demonstration during the Jamboree. Now we've arrived at current history. The last two years have been a virtual walk through history with a photo slide of past jamborees on Facebook. As I mentioned earlier, this year we're going live and in person, and throughout the years it has been the congregation coming together to make each jamboree successful, and we have grown to be the largest fundraiser for the church, raising between ten dollars and $15,000. So, where am I going? We need your help. We're looking for volunteers before, during, and after the event. We still need chairs to oversee the bake shop, which is the cookies and pies, the ice cream social booth, the cake walk, and the frog jumping contest. We need bakers for the cake walk, the pie table, and the cookie booth. You can donate cases of water, ice, and pop-up tents. There is some way that everyone can volunteer or donate. In the next few weeks, you'll be seeing sign-up sheets and additional information will be shared. So watch your emails and look at your bulletins. 
So I'm sure many of you can add to these fond memories of the 4th of July Jamboree. For those where this may be your first year, volunteer and make some memories of your own. Think about what you can do. It's not just about being a successful fundraising event. It's also about bringing the community together like those four women did in 1957. Yes, four women. I can guarantee you that, you'll ex that the experience, you'll experience the same energy and fellowship that, that has been evident throughout the years. We offer a wonderful, old-fashioned family event free to our community and beyond. Come be a part of it. Thank you for your time. Thanks, Jeff. Yeah. All right. Um, good morning. Um, I feel like I'm repeating, only on a much smaller <laughs> basis. Um, also coming back live and in person this year, hopefully, uh, will be a VBS. Um, we do need your help to make this happen. We are looking at doing it the week of July 18th to 21st, um, so four days. I have thoughts of maybe in a fifth day, um, but we'll see how everybody's schedules are. Um, obviously, we will need your help, a much different kind of commitment. Um, but please mark it on your calendar. There will be a sign-up genius happening, and you can also just tell me if you are interested. Thank you. All right, thank you. Later on in our service, we'll be lifting up prayers. If you, have, if you are online, you can share your joys and concerns by typing them in on the comments. Someone will be writing them down, and we can lift them up in prayers together. Following worship, please join us for coffee hour and for fellowship. Let us quiet our hearts and prepare for worship by listening to our prelude.
in this place of welcome, doors are opened, light shine from the windows, and among all of those gathered here, we light a candle in the name of Jesus who came to share our human love, to share our human lives, a sign of love. We celebrate God's presence who brings us encouragement and signs of hope. Let us come together and worship God in spirit and in truth. Amen. Let us join together in hymn number 433. Let us join together in the call to prayer. Move among us, God, give us life. Let your people rejoice in you. Give us again the joy of your help. With your spirit of freedom, sustain us. God, make our hearts clean. Restore us in body, mind, and spirit. Let us pray. Trusting in God's forgiveness, let us in silence confess our failings and acknowledge our part in the pain of the world. Before God, with the people of God, I confess to turning away from God in the ways I wound my life, the lives of others, and the life of the world. Christ renew you, and the Spirit enable you to grow in love. Amen. Before God, with the people of God, we confess to turning away from God in the ways we wound our lives, the lives of others, and the life of the world. May God forgive you, Christ renew you, and the Spirit enable you to grow in love. Amen. We gather together in the light of God's love and we hear the good news that God so loved this world and every single person in it so much that God gave his only son. In Jesus Christ, we see God face to face and we hear of God's mercy. Standing therefore in Jesus Christ, I celebrate with you the good news that we are loved, we are forgiven, we are cherished by God. Let us rejoice in this today and always. Amen.
I'd like to invite the children to come up for a story. Actually, come on over here because I have to show you something that's on the communion table. Okay. All right, so first, I wanted to, well, first of all, good morning. It's good to see you. <laughs> okay, so now I wanted to show you what's on the communion table because. Um, because I like it. Um, okay, you know, at Christmas time, we always have a crash, a, a manger scene set up, right, with the sheep and the donkey and all that kind of thing. But there was never, ever something for Easter, but until I saw this, which I really love. So, okay, so we just have to explain the parts in case people don't get what it is, all right? So, who, what, it, what is this, first of all? Okay, I'm going to give you, okay, this is, this is the stone that goes in front of it. All right, so what do you think was inside of there? Oh, I'm glad I'm explaining this if no one knows. Okay, so, okay, so think back. What did we just celebrate? What, what holiday? Easter, okay, all right, and what, what do we celebrate on Easter? that Jesus started to live again, okay? All right, so what we have is we have, this is what the tomb looked like, okay? It was in kind of the side of a mountain, so you have, kind of have to use your imagination that this is kind of like, like a whole hill here, okay? All these hills, and into that hill is like a cave, and that's where they would bury bodies, okay? So Jesus' body was placed inside this cave, all right? And then on Easter morning, who came? The women. There they come. Okay. They came and they were expecting to see that the, the cave was all closed up, but it wasn't because we're told that the stone had been moved. Now this stone is really light when I pick it up, but in reality, the stone would be like as big as I am, right? It would be really, really heavy. So it'd be really hard to move this, but somehow, somehow, it had been moved aside so that there is this big opening into 
the cave. All right? And they looked inside there, and what did they see? The angel. Okay? They saw the angel. And that was not what they were expecting to see. All right? What do you think the angel said to them? What do you think the angel said to them? Happy Easter? No. The angel did not say that. No. The angel said, why are you here? Basically. The angel said, why are you looking for someone who's dead? Because this is a dead place. And only dead people are here. But why are you here looking for someone who's dead? Because you know what? Jesus is not dead. He's alive. All right? So that was the good news. That's the story of Easter. So every time we see this, we see the women who would come to take care of Jesus' body, to pray here, to be sad together, because all they knew that was, was, was that Jesus had died. And here comes the angel to say, God has something more for you. Okay? So that's the story. So now when you see that, you'll know what it means. And then I wanted to show you, I have a new Bible, because I love children's Bibles. This one, everyone should get a copy of this great Bible. It's called the I Wonder Bible. And so um, at the end of each story, there are questions saying, I wonder, I wonder about that. I wonder about that. All right, so towards the end of the story. All right, there's the story of Jesus dying. And then on the next page is the story about Jesus coming alive. Okay? Now, I'm not going to read the whole story because we just kind of told the story. But here's the, okay, so see, there's the rock, the big rock that had been pushed aside from the hillside. So it kind of looks like that. Here's Jesus coming out, not dead. He's alive. There's one of the women, probably Mary. And she's so surprised, and she's not, this is not what she's expecting. And so Jesus has to say to her, I'm, I'm all right. I'm living again. And so you know, now you can go out and tell everyone. So she goes back and tells all the disciples, guess what I saw? Guess who I met? All right? And so she has a story to tell them about Jesus living again. And then there are these I wonder questions, okay? So this is, says, I wonder how I would have felt if I looked into that empty cave. I wonder how Mary felt when she realized that Jesus was really alive. And I wonder what this story has to do with my life. So there's always good questions. There's always more to learn about the stories because the stories have something to say to us. And then we can ask questions. I wonder, I wonder what it was like back then. I wonder what it felt back then. I wonder what it's saying to me right now. So these are our stories. So um, it's a great Bible. I'm going to give it. So Miss Jessica has already looked at this, but I'm going to give it to her so she can look at it some more and share it with you guys. OK, it's a great Bible great stories. Okay, so now, if anyone asks you about why we have this on the altar here, on the communion table, you'll know. It's all about the story of Easter. Okay? All right. Let's, um, let's pray together. Dear God, thank you that you give us great stories. Thank you that your stories tell us about things that are so real, about times that are sad, about people who die, about your hope of resurrection, about coming to us in surprising ways. Help us to have open eyes and open hearts and help us to wonder more about you. Thank you for letting us ask questions. Help us to look and search for you each and every day. We pray all of these things in the name of Jesus, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. All right, thanks. Thanks for coming up with me.
Our Old Testament lesson comes from the book of Psalms. Psalms 37 reminds us of God's presence during troubled times. Today we'll read this responsively starting with the right side and the left side. So we'll start with the right side. Don't be anxious because of the wicked. Don't envy those who do wrong. They will wither as quickly as grass and fade like the flowers of the field. Trust, Trust in God, God and do good. good. Settle, Settle down, down and, and be at peace. peace. Let God be your, your deep delight and, and give, give you your heart's, heart's desire. desire. Give your life over to God who will bring us the best in you. Your integrity will be clear, as bright as the noonday sun. Be still in the presence of God. Calm yourself and wait patiently. Don't be jealous of those who get rich or be vexed by those who are devious. Stop ranting. Control your rage. Blind anger gives birth to trouble. And wicked will be driven out. The land will belong to the humble. Turn from evil, love what is good, and you will be at peace. God is a lover of justice who will never abandon the faithful. Before the crucifixion, Peter denied Jesus three times. After the resurrection, Jesus forgave him and sent him out to share the good news of new life and hope. Acts 9, 36 through 43. In Joppa, there was a disciple named Tabitha. In Greek, Greek, her name was Dorcas. She was always doing good and helping the poor. But about that time, she became sick and died. And her body was washed and placed in an upstairs room. Leda was near Joppa. So when the disciples heard that Peter was in Leda, they sent two men to him and urged him, please come at once. Peter went with them, and when he arrived, he was taken upstairs to the room. All the, win the widows stood around him, crying and showing him the robes and other clothing that Dorcas, or Tabitha, had made while she was still with them. Peter sent them out of the room, then he got down on his knees and he prayed. Turning toward the dead woman, he said, Tabitha, get up. She opened her eyes, and seeing Peter, she sat up. He took her by the hand and helped her to her feet. Then he called for the believers, especially the widows, and presented her to them alive. This became known all over Joppa, and many people believed in the Lord. Peter stayed in Joppa for some time with a tanner named Simon. May God add blessings to the reading of these words. Amen. Amen. So it's so good to be back with you again. I just got back from 10 days in Scotland and that was the final piece of my sabbatical. I had meant to do this part of the trip last year when I was on sabbatical, but because of the pandemic, I wasn't doing international travel. So it got pushed off until this year. But that meant that there's this kind of neat symmetry that happened with my sabbatical because last year in 2021, on May 1st, we had this wonderful kickoff picnic at Roseland Park when we were kind of starting the whole sabbatical experience and welcoming Danielle and it was the beginning of a new thing. And then this year in 2022, on May 1st, I was traveling back from Scotland. So it really was kind of the marking the end of this extraordinary experience. So my heart is really filled with gratitude for the whole experience of, uh, of the sabbatical. And just also wanting to thank all of you for making that possible because you are a congregation that supports the whole idea of sabbatical and being able to take kind of a step back and a breather and get some perspective and kind of look at how things are, a chance to learn and be renewed. And then also to the Lilly Foundation for the wonderful grant 
um, that we received that made things possible so that I was able to do things like rent a cottage on a lake for a month last May and go to Alaska for seven weeks and then go to Iona and bring my very best friend Patty with me. Um, so she traveled with me and we've been friends since we were in brownies together a long time. Uh, <laughs> So I could talk to you about Iona for a really long time. I won't tell you everything I know about Iona right now, but um, I will just tell you that Iona is a tiny little island. It's about three miles long and a mile wide. It's off the coast of Scotland, and there are about, I don't know, 175 people that live there year-round, but there are more than 250,000 people that go there during the year kind of as a site of pilgrimage, as a place to go to be renewed and a place to experience. Partly it's just because it's beautiful, because it's an island off the coast of Scotland. And so there are these beautiful green fields and there's sheep everywhere and those, those shaggy cows, you know, the Scottish cows. And they're in those fields and the fields go down to the water and the waves are coming in. I mean, it's really so often you, you just feel like you're kind of standing in a painting because you just can't believe that this is real because it is so beautiful. And I have to say that I packed my, because I looked, I looked at the forecast for Iona, and every time I looked at the forecast for Iona, it was windy and it was raining. So I packed my raincoat and my wool hat and my mittens and my scarf, and I got there, and the sun was shining <laughs> every single day. I didn't even take my raincoat out. Now, everyone that was there, everyone that lived there told me, <laughs> It's not really like this. Um, you just, whatever, you're just here for this, this week of extraordinary weather. Um, but the real draw that's in Iona is that it is known as this thin place, as a place that um, has less of a barrier, a paper-thin barrier between earth and heaven, a place where God can be experienced in a different way, a place perhaps when, when God can be heard in a different way. So way back in the year 563, there was a man named Columba who came from Ireland by boat, which is the best way to go to Iona because traveling by land takes a long time, like two days, to get there. But by boat, there he was sailing by and he saw this beautiful little island and he stopped there and as he stepped onto the shores of Iona, he said, this is a place where God should be worshipped. And so right then, he established a, a Christian community there and invited people to travel to this beautiful place. And then later on, in the 1200s, there was a whole uh, group of Benedictine monks who came, and they built this beautiful stone abbey that is just, you know, with towering ceilings and big windows, and it's just a beautiful kind of magnificent place to worship. Now, I have to say that the Protestants kind of ruined all that. Sorry, Benedictine monks, because then in like 1560, all the Protestants came and said, no more Catholic churches. And so they let the abbey just kind of fall into ruins. But um, in the early 30s, there was a Scottish man, Scottish uh, minister named George MacLeod, and he was feeling like the, the Scottish churches in the towns and the cities were not listening, were not hearing the people, were not responding to the work and the will of the people, and that they, the churches were, he felt like, kind of their life was kind of dimming, and they just wasn't doing as well as they should. So he went to Iona, and he said, we should rebuild this abbey. We're going to have people come here, and we're going to establish a community that is for work and for worship, for prayer and for protest, for a time of being aware of God's call to fill our lives, not just in worship, but everywhere that we go. And so now uh, that Iona community continues, it is made up from people from all over the world who come. A lot of them come as volunteers. They come for a few weeks or some months, or maybe some years. Um, there's a few people that work there permanently, and they um, invite everyone to come in to worship. And so they worship twice a day at 9 o'clock in the morning and 9 o'clock in the evening. And I think that if you walked into their worship service, it would feel very comfortable. It feels very familiar in a lot of ways because there is this emphasis on inclusion and welcome 
and wanting everyone to be able to come there and wanting everyone to hear that they are known and loved by God. And so there's different people from the community that lead worship every day, um, lay people um, from all over the world, and you never know what kind of accent you're going to hear when the person stands up. I mean, it could be this really thick Irish brogue. It could be someone who's speaking English as their second or third or fourth. It's very humbling to be there because everyone speaks more than one language, and here the Americans are like, mm, do you speak English? Because that's what I speak. Um, and so, and they all did. Um, beautifully. So there was a lot of similarities. There are also some differences. Um, maybe, maybe you could sense some of that. So the opening part of our worship was taken from the book of the, um, of the Iona Abbey, from their book of worship. And the words are just different enough that it made me think, that it made me hear them in slightly different ways. So worship always began with a welcome but not with actually a call to worship. Because the assumption, the understanding of the community is that everything we do, everything that we do in our lives is meant to be an act of worship. So it isn't like you walk into church and say, okay, now I'm gonna worship God. And then you walk out of church and say, okay, done with that. No, instead, everything that we do, that worship is not supposed to be something that we stop and then start again. But it's not supposed to be this separate action in our lives, but that everything woven through our entire lives is how we are going to worship God. So whatever we were doing before, whether we were doing the dishes or we were tending to the children or we were out in the garden or we were taking a rest or whatever we were doing, that that would be part of our worship that that would be a part of our awareness of God. And that then we can come together and celebrate the fact that, yeah, God is with us. We can celebrate that. We will worship God intentionally together. We will lift up our voices. We will pray together. We will sing together. And then as we disperse, there won't be an Iona, a formal benediction saying, go out into the world. But instead, it's like, go, continue your worship wherever you are. Imagine how different our world would be if all of our words and all of our actions were understood as an act of worship. Imagine if the words that were spoken in the store or at the gas station or between neighbors was meant to honor God and respect the person that we were speaking to. Imagine if our actions, when people are driving or engaging with one another, what if those actions honored God and was saw, seen as a form of worship? How different our world would be. So every day in the Abbey, there are Psalms read and over the course of six weeks, probably about a third of all of the Psalms in the Bible are read. And as much as I appreciate like creativity and innovation and trying something really new, there is also something about repetition. There is also something about hearing things over and over again until those words kind of start to seep in until I've heard this before. Maybe I can wonder about what that means, what it's saying to me. So in that spirit, so we printed Psalm 37 in the bulletin today. So I hope, this is my request, I hope that you'll take the bulletin home with you, and I hope that you'll just try this week to read that psalm every day. The same thing over and over again. And just see if it sounds different, depending on where you're at in your life, depending on how you're feeling that day, depending on what you just heard in the news, depending on what someone might have just told you. Hear the words that are given to us because they are ancient words and yet sometimes, sometimes, they sound like they were just written yesterday, especially for us. So I hope that you'll take that psalm and then if you want to, um, so this is now bringing out kind of the Bible nerd in me because I really love these psalms, okay? You could look at the psalm and maybe you could even take a pen and then you could start to circle some of the words that talk about the things that are wrong in the world. Because the psalmist is honest. 
he is very honest. He has his eyes open, his spirit is wide, and he sees the problems in the world. And he says, you know what? There are wicked people in the world. And there are people who are doing things that are wrong. And there are people who are getting rich, and they don't care anything about anyone else. And then he says, there are people who are devious, and their actions are actively hurting others. He says, there, are, there is evil in the world, and it is at work, and it is powerful. He names it. All of it is true. And then the psalmist, who is this very wise person, also knows what our very human reactions tend to be, because now we've heard about all this evil and all this devious people and all people who are doing terrible things. And he knows how overwhelming that can be, and he anticipates what we're going to do. And he says, don't be anxious because he knows that we will be when we're feeling powerless, when we're feeling helpless, when we're feeling maybe hopeless, like as if everything is spinning out of control, and what are we supposed to be doing about that? And he says, and don't be jealous of those people who seem to be gaining more and more when you seem to be leaving, being left behind. Don't be envious of those who are plowing through life, hurting other people, and never being punished themselves. And here's a word that I never use, but it's a good one. He says, don't be vexed. That's a good word. Don't be vexed. Don't be annoyed. Don't be angry. Don't be frustrated. And he names it again. He says, because, you know, y'all tend to rant. And there's a lot of raging and some blind anger going on, striking out at everyone and everything. And I think that's a pretty fair description of the world that we live in. A lot of anger, a lot of ranting, a lot of blind anger. The psalmist gets it and he tells it like it is. And he tells us that it's important to read the words again and again because after you've circled everything that's wrong in the world, then you might go back to the psalm and notice what's right, what's bigger, what's more powerful than the evil that he just named. Because he says, it's true. There are wicked people in the world. And here's the promise. God is a lover of justice who will never abandon the faithful. That's what we have to hold on to. That God is a lover of justice who will never abandon the faithful. We're not alone. The problems are real, but we are not alone in this. God is at work in the world that so desperately needs God's help. So don't be anxious. Don't give up. Let's not waste our time ranting. Instead, let's turn to, the God, to God and offer our actions to God. So believing, like the people in Iona, that everything that we do can be an act of worship, know that the big and small things that you do they matter. That card that you wrote to the person who is sick, it's an act of worship. The phone call that you made to the friend who feels lonely, that's an act of worship. The groceries that you picked up, the neighbor that you listened to, the person that you listen to, even though you know there is nothing you can do to change their situation, and that their situation might just be sad, it may even be heartbreaking, but the listening that you do, that's an act of worship. That is our gift to God. And our faith tells us that God takes our gifts and multiplies them, uses them in ways that we may not understand, but we trust by giving that to God. God will use our actions. We can't afford to get paralyzed by the real damage that's being done in this world. And that's what I see, just as a final note, in that story about Peter and Tabitha in Acts. Because after the resurrection, of course, the, the disciples were like, well, now what? And Jesus was like, go out and live this faith. And so in the story, Tabitha is dead. There's nothing more to do. The story seems to be over, but the disciples still call Peter in because they need someone there in their grief. And sometimes that's what we'll be called to do. We will just be called to sit with others, 
we will be called to listen to others. We will be called to say, you're right. This is sad. And I'm here with you in the sadness. Peter trusts that God is in that moment. We're called to be with God's people. Our worship becomes our work, and our work becomes our worship. We're on the journey together. And the psalmist says, stop ranting. Control your rage. Blind anger gives birth to trouble. The wicked will be driven out. Thy land will be given to the humble. Turn from evil. Love what is good. And you will be at peace. God is a lover of justice who will never abandon the faithful. Amen. traditional Irish or Scottish song. This is an Irish song. Most of the traditional Irish music is a cappella. And it's very often about people having to leave Ireland and people not wanting to leave, but they're, they were starving around the turn of the century after the second potato famine, and the potatoes went up to England. And um, there was, there's, there's just a lot, well, I'm just going to sing it. <coughs> Sorry. <laughs> sit ye down, loyal comrade, sit ye down for a while, till I spend my last hours around Aaron's green isle. Come fill our pure glasses and we'll drink hand in hand for tomorrow I'll be leaving the shores of Lachlan. There's my father and mother, you could now hear them cry. With their tears bewailing would moisten your eye. But I will assist them, please God, if I can. Far away from lovely Erin and the shores of Lachlan. In the end, come in morning, I will bid you adieu to Lee Trom, Drum Shambo, and sweet Carrie, too. But no matter what fortune I might make far away, my thoughts shall be with you by night and by day. My thoughts shall be with you while life's courses ban far away from lovely Erin and the shores of Lachlan. Amen. As we pause to lift up our prayers, um, I would like to ask for prayers for my friend Patty, who I mentioned. Um, she just texted me this morning to say that she's in the hospital, so um, I don't know exactly what's going on, but so prayers for her that she's surrounded by God's presence. And also, while I was away, I was really convicted by the power of prayers, so I wanted to... Um, 
offer times of prayer. So every Friday at noon um, throughout May and June, I'm going to be in the sanctuary lifting up prayers for the community and for our world. If you would like to join me, I would love to have you here. If you would like to um, send in prayer requests, you can do that as well. You can be in touch with me, and I promise that we will lift up those prayers on Fridays at noon. And I'm wondering what joys and concerns you'd like to share this morning. Karen. Sorry, I always seem to have something, but I, uh, I've been asking you to pray um, for my dear friend Kenneth Welsh, who was in his last days, and this week he was blessed to finally ease his suffering and die. And um, he's left us with so much joy, and he's a very fine, uh, renowned actor, so he left a lot of people with wonderful memories of great performances. So blessings to him. Amen. Nancy. Hi, um, my daughter has lived in uh, Virginia Beach for the last 10 years. Uh, her husband is in, in the Navy. Well, he's retiring um, and they're moving back to this area this, um, this summer. It really is happening. I was like afraid to say anything to jinx it, but it really is happening. He has a job in Windsor starting in June and she'll be up here in July, so I will be able to see my grandchildren whenever I want instead of once or twice a year. So I'm very, very thankful for that. Amen. Wonderful. Sarah Jo. I have a celebration. Karen just bought a new car. <laughs> and it is a Prius Prime plug-in, but the best part about it is that it's rocket red in color, <laughs> which is so unlike, Karen is so understated normally, so I just think that's a riot. <laughs> <laughs> awesome, and good for the environment, awesome. Val. We have a lot of people um, checking in this morning. Jerry Michella, Suzanne Warner, Linda from Florida, um, Lori from Costa Rica, um, all saying good morning. Um, the McFarlands are recovering from head colds. They'll be back soon. Um, Jay Lee Stokes says a big thank you to Outreach and the church for food that was provided. And she is volunteering for the Jamboree, Lynn, so just mark her down. Um, and many welcome backs to Pastor Sue um, and happy Mother's Day. And I have a joy. Um, sure, I tell you. Um, my daughter graduated from college yesterday. <laughs> And I was thinking this morning as I walked into church that not so long ago, that confirmation photo with all of those kids that year, and they're all graduating this year. So moms of confirmands do not blink because it goes really fast. And my daughter is moving to Virginia wow. in July. So um, happy for her. Happy and sad, but mostly happy. Thanks, Val. Christine. Oh. Good morning. I just wanted to give um, an update. All through um, this winter and Lent, we had a pile of towels that were accumulating here. Um, and I wanted to let folks know that where they went and how they affected people's lives. Um, they went to the, the emergency shelter, they went to the no-free shelter, they went to some residents from the Sunshine Flower, I'm um, Sunshine House Fire, on um, so many people that had the need. And we got a wonderful thank you from one of the agencies that run the emergency shelters, and they were just so supportive and such gratitude to all the support they get to make a positive difference. And they said they provided 25,000 meals, 365 nights of housing, 44 families, and 307 individuals had housing for each night, and 37 people had access to the no-freeze shelter. So when there's families in the homeless shelter, 
they keep the children and families there, and then individual men usually go to the no-freeze shelter in the winter. And unfortunately, in the warm weather, people are camping in the woods. It's hidden. You don't see it here in northeastern Connecticut. Um, but they still have connection and contact uh, with our community liais liaison with the police. So we just wanted to share that those towels and the linens we collected during Lent, they've really touched so many people's lives. And so I just wanted to thank you. So celebration that we can help, but just the need is just so strong. So thank you. Thank you so much, Christine. Susan. Um, I have a pray, uh, prayer request. Um, a young girl, 15-year-old, uh, um, her name is Emily, and she attempted suicide this week, and um, she was almost very successful, and she's in the ICU at UMass. So, thank you. So, prayers for Emily. Amen. Nancy. Hi, I'm Nancy Green. I haven't met all of you, but uh, we live up the road. And we have a neighbor that got a devastating uh, diagnosis this week. So there's kind of sadness floating up on the top of the hill. Mm. And I just ask for your prayers. Amen. Thanks, Nancy. Knowing that we are here and wherever we find ourselves this morning in the presence of God and that our prayers, whether spoken out loud or whispered in the depths of our spirits, are treasured by God. Knowing that, let us join our hearts together in prayer. Let us pray. Holy One, you who welcome and include and seek out all of your people, we thank you. We thank you for the gift of your love, for the promise of new life, for your promise that we will never be forgotten by you. We thank you that you are a lover of justice and that you are in work, at work in a world that needs your justice and your hope. We thank you for honest words written so long ago that speak to our hearts today. Help us to take heart and to have hope because you are at work in our world and in our lives. We come before you just as we are today and we give thanks for lives that have been completed, for people who have gone home to you, who now know the peace that passes our understanding, but that is your promise to all of your people. We pray for those who are in the hospital and those who have received a diagnosis that is scary. In those times when we are in over our heads, when we seem not to have any answers, when we don't know what it is that we can do, we thank you that we can trust you, that you are at work in our lives. Help us, Lord, to offer our actions, our words, and our deeds to you, that they may be multiplied by your Holy Spirit. We thank you for those who help those who are homeless and who are struggling. We pray for people who don't know where they will sleep tonight and those who are not sure where their next meal will come from. We pray for those who are running away from what used to be a safe place, people who are refugees, people who, whose lives have been turned upside down. And we pray for peace, a peace that we may not see as possible right now, but that we pray for because you make all things possible. We thank you for times of celebration. We thank you for mothers, for children. We thank you for graduations. We thank you for those milestone moments in our lives when we need to pause and give thanks. And we offer our gratitude up to you. Just as we are today, Lord, whether we are happy or sad, whether we are tired or energetic, whether we are filled with doubt or convicted by our faith, just as we are, we are loved by you, and we come by to you and offer to you our prayers.
to you be the honor and glory, dominion and power now and forever. Amen. As we pause to mark our gratitude, we've already heard of the difference that our offerings make with gratitude for meals delivered, with gratitude for towels and linens that have been shared. The actions that we offer to God are blessed and multiplied by God. So we give to God our gifts, knowing that they first came from God. So let us stand and offer to God our thanks and praise. We come before you with hearts filled with gratitude and we give thanks for all that you have done for us. We entrust to you our lives and our gifts. We ask you to use us, Lord, and send us out as your messengers that we may share words of new life and hope. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. into the world and know that you are surrounded by the love of God, the peace of Christ, and the strength and comfort of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let's share our joy.
Sing of the Lord's goodness, Father of all wisdom. Come to him and bless his name. Mercy he has shown us, his love is forever, faithful to the end of days. Come then, all you nations, sing of your Lord's goodness, melodies of praise and thanks to God. Bring out the Lord's glory, praise him with your music, worship him and bless his name. Power he has wielded, honor is his garment, risen from the snares of death. His word he has spoken, one bread he has broken, new life gives to all. Come then, all you nations, sing of your Lord's goodness, melodies of praise and thanks to God. Ring out the Lord's glory, praise him with your music, worship him and bless his name. Praise him with your singing, praise him with the trumpet, praise God with the lute and harp. Praise him with the cymbals, praise him with your dancing, praise God till the end of days. Come then all you nations, sing of your Lord's goodness, melodies of praise and thanks to God. Ring out the Lord's glory, praise him with your music, worship him and bless his name.